And so let's talk about another possible scenario then that you probably hear that. So, you know, I'm the CEO of a big, of a multinational, right? And my division in say, let me ch choose an area like the Middle East, right? Is not successful. Everywhere else in the world, I'm doing pretty well, but my one division in one part of the globe isn't doing very well. Let's, I'm going to take Middle East as an, an example of that. Um, outside of kind of global economic, you know, global factors around that. But what should I do if one of my international divisions isn't, isn't as successful as I'd like it to be? What can I do? Um, so there are a lot of ways to approach. So when I talk about people, I talk to people about that I'm, I'm helping businesses on their international growth. And that could mean a lot of things, right? But my, from my point, from my perspectives, perspectives and also how I deal to look into it, it's kind of step back on looking into, I think it's good to look into your data um, to start with, like where, what are the things like, where are the draw off and why, uh, to get as much information as possible uh, in terms of what data you have, like how people, mm -hmm. how your users, for example, in the media is kind of um, looking, look, um, like how they look like for now uh, and so on. Um, yeah. And then get as much insight as possible. And you can, from there, you can create some hypothesis of why you think the, the, the it's not growing as much as you want in at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, and then on that on sense as well, like Middle East is big, right? Like, do you have a sense of like which market? Kind of break it down slightly. Like, are you talking about Dubai or UAE, or you're talking about Saudi, or you're talking about any other like um, uh, markets in, in and see whether there's a. a because that's a, a key difference. point there, isn't it? Right? Is that I talked about in the Middle East? There is one unit of countries, Arabic-speaking countries, right? But they're not all the same, are they? Arabic speaking countries. Oh, very, very much different. So I just came back from Saudi Arabia actually um, two months last month, yeah. um, and that is very different from Dubai. Like you know, it, it, it's, I think Middle East um, market is very interesting because there's potential, there's money, there, are, you know, there are a lot that is growing in a lot of markets. But there are also another elements of um, um, religions within that as well. So yeah. each countries within the region, Middle East regions, they have different way of uh, approach their Islamic um, teachings and, and so on. So, okay. you know, like Dubai is very international and they take mm. them years to get to that point. And Saudi Arabia is opening up with reformations and it's a process. And then there's certain countries still, you know, like growth. So there are a lot of different layers to look into and expats versus locals. And, you know, like there are a yeah. lot of elements and who are you targeting uh, when you talk about that? And then even within a market, for example, talking about Saudi Arabia, because it just came back and it's like, there's a lot of different um, la layers of um, groups as well. Uh, we call it SEC or social economy um, levels. Like, are you talking yeah. about you are targeting the rich one or actually um, the lower level? So I think there are a lot of knowing, understanding who you're actually targeting, who you should target and, and you are targeting versus will be yeah. in important. And um, yeah, I think for me, when I talk about growth is like, look at your data and then look into more granularity. So when I talk mm -hmm. about culture, people always think about as just the people, how they behave, you know, their beliefs and attitude. But actually you have to think about the holistic view of that market because mm -hmm. how, they, how they behave and how they think, how, going to, how they expect your product to be or interact with your product, very much influenced by their environment, right? And we're talking yeah. about the history of the countries and the, the, the I talk about uh, religions and it could be the political setup throughout the years that shape who they are or te technology infrastructure that they have, they are being given this infrastructure in this country. So that's how they behave, mm -hmm. going to behave because they have to go through, put up with a very um, slow um, internet or actually super fast. So their behavior change slightly different and what they need from you is slightly different. So it's kind of looking into the whole picture of what does that yeah. mean? Um, contradictions you might see on their behaviors, like why? We see a lot of contradictions behavior in, in Saudi, yeah. for example. Like they say this, like this means it should behave like that, but no, but this because of another element. So you need to understand that so that it helps you to do the right decisions on what you should adapt on your current business or propositions. Okay. Um, or you shouldn't change anything, but you need yeah. to kind of um, look into something else to enhance other things. No, I really like that. So it's the idea that because I just said Arabic speaking countries or a division, which is the Middle East, is that too broad, right? The more you mm -hmm. focus down to the detail in each individual country, 
you'll see trends of the data in different places, right? And different communities within that. And that's where the answer lies, not across the wider division. Because it's easy for us to say that from our HQ, Middle East is not performing. But the reality is, is it's much more subtle than that. Certain countries are going to be different. Certain groups within that are going to be different. And you need to understand that to be able to make a difference and to make the change you need to make. Yeah, it's okay. very, it's very important. And also, I talk about like understanding them. There's so much data or information or insights you can get from everywhere. It's, you know, like yeah. I think ultimately the whole thing is about really properly understanding the, 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 who you are serving and how they behave and how, and yeah. that kind of, but not just them, but also look into your own businesses. So I look back as well on mm-hmm. your business, like how that align with your own business, how that align with your, your propositions, because you don't want to change your identity too much. Course. Um, to the point that people don't recognize you as brand because sometimes yeah. international brand is actually a good thing in that market. You want to use that as a as a leverage, but then at the same time you want to kind of fit into their cultural nuances as well. Like yeah. where is the balance? And so it's kind of creating empathy for the business, but also creating empathy for the users and find that balance between. Oh, I love that. And it sounds as well like a, a skill of a. A C-suite operative or a CEO looking at these divisions is understanding you don't know everything about that country. You can't, and I don't think you're going to take a stereotype, but you're not going to take a broad brush to what you think is going on. There's going to be a lot of subtleties as to why a country is successful or not successful that maybe you as an individual are not aware of and you can't mm-hmm. see because it's not something you've come across before. Yeah. And it's funny, it's uh, talking about like everyone have their own point of view of what they think the market, especially c suite, like you very smart people, right? They probably have a lot of knowledge in, in how they see uh, different markets or how they see how they can build into a different market. But sometimes one of the exercises I actually do quite a lot with um, businesses before we even say, if let's say we want to grow Indonesia market, like, like where to start or yeah. what should we do and everything. I gather them together to do an exercise to get again. In, I call it four bucket exercise. So it's yeah. kind of like, okay, tell everyone, everyone tell everyone like what you know already or what you think or know already. And, and then you like put it in. Four bucket. Different... Yeah, I love it. Yeah. 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 One is mm-hmm. like facts. Like it's sure, it's definitely a fact. Like everyone knows that we have. And then the other one is yeah. strong hypothesis. Like I think we very sure, but we want to, you need a bit more to kind of add the, the ingredient into it and make it stronger. Or make it into the fact. I think that's great. If you have a strong hypothesis, move them into the fact. And then you have the third bucket is um, weak hypothesis. Like, I think so, mm. yeah, but not sure, maybe. And then last one is unknowns. It's like, unknowns is a tricky one because you don't know what you don't know. But actually, it's quite, sometimes it's good to say, like, how do they even look for um, candidates? You know, like very wise um, questions. Yeah. That's fine. Um, when I do this exercise, um, you can see a lot of posters is going to the fact ones because everyone, we know that, we heard it and everything. Yeah. And then what, once I start telling them, I'm going to go through one by one and then whoever will put in, I have to say why they know it's a fact. You need to give us resources. Mm-hmm. And then when I ask, asking one person about that, you can slowly see the, 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 the other posters is moving. <laughs> to, to <some laughs> that because they don't have anything to back it up. It's yeah. like, okay, maybe it's not fact. So I think that's important because otherwise you're going to make a decision. So it's fact, we not, don't need to uh, validate or invalidate them anymore. Um, yeah. And then your decision is going to, business decision is going to make from that. And it might be a wrong one. And you, you know, it's kind of, yeah, it's, you put your shit yourself into the foot if you kind of say that. So I think that is a good one to do. And then from there you can say, okay, strong hypothesis and weak and that. Then you can start analyzing what we need to know to actually go back to the market, say, go back to the core reason, like we want to grow this market. And so grow, like what does that mean? Grow in terms of you want to just have more users, even though there are free users, it's fine. Or you want to have paid users or you want them to engage on your, on your site for more than an hour a day or whatever, like what they want to product come back every month. So understanding that is important is great. Wow, I love that. But that exercise is great because, like you say, that that just then gets everything out of the system. All those beliefs you you think you have of a country that are going to make it harder than you think it might be to to do any work or launch into that country. I love that really because you know when we've worked together before, we've heard many of these. Like you know, Japan is an impossible market to break into. You know, Koreans don't like 
purple or black, you know, all of these <laughs> beliefs that people believe to be the case that ultimately aren't. What are yeah. some of the most unusual beliefs that you've heard then? What, what are some of the stereotypes oh. or difficulties that aren't simply true out there? I think I was talking to a New Zealander there one day. It's like everyone say Australia and us is the same. It's like, no, we're not the same. We're like, I think that's one of very easy one people because it's English so speaking. Australians and New Zealanders are not the same. That's a good one, right? Absolutely. That's it. It's yeah. a very a different culture. Because, because different cultures close enough because they're so far yeah. away from the world yeah. and the English speaking, but actually they have a very different um, thought on that as well. And what was the one about Korea? What's the colour in Korea that people you're not supposed to use? Can you remember that one? You I don't even one. remember that because it's I, don't care. Green, I don't think it's, I don't think one of these sort of think... Italians don't like purple. I remember all these <laughs> myths that we've heard. Because really colour seems... to me, so the other thing I saw online, like, you know, if you kind of Google cultural, like, things, like, you can find a lot of them. And so I just, like, sometimes I just, like, front of, yeah, <laughs> it's like, talk about, and then they use, they use a lot of reasons, say, oh, yeah, they like this colour because of this, it represents this, this represents that. But actually, yeah, sure, this colour plays an elements within what you kind of provide. You, if you don't, you could kind of show, like, for example, red is kind of, like, risk and then warning and things like that and sure asian like chinese and us like re like red is good thing chinese new year coming soon and we will all wear red we have red pockets yeah. where everything is red but also it is it, also still represent warnings as well you know like if you yeah. kind of warning so some some color is actually quite cross right so um, just another myth is the color thing that's really good to hear yeah, yeah. and the other thing as well that there are someone told me yesterday on linkedin as well on a post like people talk about hostess, um, you know, hostess, you remember, yeah, the cultural yeah. dimensions, yeah. It's good. It's I talk, it gave a talk. I did bring it out. It's, it's a good reference for people to know power distance versus, um, and then also the feminist, feminine. Yeah, so hostess talks about cultural, like, um, in individualistic Dimension. and collective society, doesn't yeah. it? Like, individualistic, yeah. yes, is very, five or six Americans, I can do it on my own, whereas collectivistic is like. Japan together. and China, where we are a group together, we have to do things together. Yes, which hostess. is good. Which is a good reference. Um, like for example, like uh, one example, like um, we did research on um, a journal, um, uh, at, um, journals, um, medical journals, um, online, and people mm. like in in the Europe were saying like, oh, who, what is the, um, what is the publications and and so on. Like they ask very specific question. Whereas in Asia, on Japan, specifically, people are asking like, oh, who else actually you quotes this? Who else actually think this is a good article? Yeah. Think about other people. So yes, that's elements on that um, dimension is useful. But also, I find that really hard to put it in a perspective. Like, okay, if it is feminism and also all collectivist and individualistic, one country and the other, and you design a website, for example, like, well, how do you convert that? Like, do you... Yeah, does it do mean you, yeah, and it's also yeah. down down to the designer and down to whoever who designs to say, oh, because they are individualistic, we should we should design this. That is subjective view. Um, so yeah, I think it's a good reference to start to understand different culture. But I, I yeah, I think to be practical, you just have to be very careful of what you've seen out there, well, what that. you read out there. Even sometimes, you know, when I was doing the four bucket exercise, like people yeah. Were saying, yeah, the local team, the local sales team, or local tell tell me tell us this and. With that, I wouldn't put in fact as well because there's certain elements of um, bias and, and personal mm. view by the local person, um, local sales team as well. So it might it might be true in certain la layer, but it might be also their own perspective as well. So with okay. that, I always feel like you should still change. Because, I mean, that then brings us towards the, that, that classic question then. So if an international team like a team in a particular country isn't performing, right? Well, you, that's the perception because they are culturally different from us in the US or the UK. That's also not also often the case then, is it? The cultural differences within the, how the team operate in a particular country compared to the main organization. Talk us through that. What are the kind of some of the, the mishaps and mistakes that people make in that, in that part of dealing with an what international What do you mean? Do you mean like when they have international team, they run slightly differently? What do you mean, sorry? So a team in a specific country isn't performing or seen as not being performing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's seen as being a cultural reason why they're not performing. Like, and I'm going to say this, like Brits are not great salespeople, for example. You could say that, well, the Brits are not great mm -hmm. at salespeople. That's why we don't sell much more in the UK. Like yeah. challenges what like that come yeah. out. 
So damn, that is 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 not good. <laughs> As we yeah. all know, it's just to, to, to just say like oh because they are not because of one reason. I think it's quite good. It's be will be interesting to kind of look into why. So it yeah. might be the, the the team itself is not really the right team to run yeah. um, the market. Um, it might be the case then you might have to look into like changing the team or shuffle around or, or whatever. But it also might be because the the setup of the business or how the business is being uh, set in the US, for example, and the local team can't do much to change that, right. that limited what they can do with the market. So they might be restricted with the, um, with mm. the limitations of what they can do that cost them the reason or um, make them the reason that they can grow the business. It might be the case or it might be the local team actually didn't really properly understand what is missing as well. Even they are locals, right. they might miss certain element um, that cultural nuances that they are so familiar with but they didn't see that as opportunity yeah. this happens as well when we do research if you use we see that uh, i see that again and again in local in, in research you use a real local researcher to do interviews and everything and i sit in and i kind of oh that is very interesting what they say can you promote and this is like yeah but this is very normal like why is it so you know like why are you so excited about obvious. knowing this yeah uh, yeah but it's actually was a key thing for us because it's so different that make them so unique. We should do something about it. So sometimes um, local um, experts or, or we might actually oversee something that too close to them. Yeah. It might be the case. So I think it's kind of like be, be good for if you say the team is not, um, is that because of the team or because we don't know the business as well? I think it's good to investigate what causing That's really interesting. the limitations of those. Yeah, back to the data again, digging in deep to understand what's really going on rather than relying on a perceived stereo, not going to say stereotype, perceived belief about something as well. Oh, yeah. I love that. That's a really nice and way And sometimes, sometimes you don't even need a very strong data to give a sense or a, 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 a neglect, like, a, a fit, like where to even start, like talking to the yeah. team and looking into, you know, how they set up, go out and, and spend a day or two in their environment, in their office to, to see how they actually mm, interact, like the that. pain that they're having. Go out with them to see your local customers for a bit, and yeah. even going out not to talk about your business or everything for you to understand how that feels in that environment. Um, that, that will be a great, great insight. Well. 